In this video, we're going to take a look at the relationship between cross-sectional area, volume, and integration. So before we even go down this road, we better uh, back up and look at some basic notions of how we measure uh, length and area and volume. And we need units for all of these things. So once you pick a unit of length, if you build a square with edges that are both one unit of length, then by definition, you have one square unit of area. Very simple idea. And of course, if you build a cube with um, one more dimension of unit length, then by definition, that cube encompasses one cubic unit of volume. So, you know, you need to remember this very basic definition. And once you have this definition, then there's a certain volume, um, there's a certain volume formula that makes perfect sense, especially if you've ever played with blocks. You, you start um, stacking some blocks. And if you just count the number of blocks, uh, then you've counted volume because each block encompasses one cubic unit of volume. So here's a 24 unit um, box. It's got volume 24. And of course, you can count all the sides. And it's no accident that the volume is 3 times 2 times 4, which is 24. So what's going on here is basically it's a consequence of the way we're defining volume and area and length that um, these nice properties uh, hold. So in this case, the base area is 3 times 2. It's 6. And so what we want to take away from this is that the base area times the height is giving us the volume. And, and this is the principle we want to really focus in on right here. Base area times height is volume for a box. So you could take a square and lay it on the ground and then build sort of a box out of it and sweep it through uh, height h and the volume will be the base area times the height and would, in this case uh, the area is x squared so we've got this clever little uh, formula for volume of a box with a square base now if you remember your geometry you realize this trick works for a cylinder too so if you took a circle with radius r and swept it through a height h you'd obtain a cylinder and, um, and uh, the volume would be the area times the height, and the area is pi r squared, so you get this formula for the volume of a cylinder. But um, why, why would this still work? We're not working with boxes anymore, we're working with a circular base. As a matter of fact, does it work with any old object? So if you took some blob, and once again you uh, swept it through height h to form a so-called uh, cylinder over that region, uh, and you didn't know what the area was, but um, you still might be confident that the volume should be a times h. Well, it is, but why? So it's worth taking a few moments to think through an argument as to why this is at least plausible, if not an actual proof. So uh, this blob, we could approximate the area by building a whole bunch of little rectangles on the inside. And if the rectangles are small enough, we can probably get a pretty good approximation. Now, each of these rectangles, let's say they're uniform in width and height. So we'll call these widths and heights delta x and delta y. And each of those little um, rectangles contributes a little bit. And if you add up all these delta x, delta y's, so notice that n happens to be exactly the number of rectangles we're able to fit inside of our blob. So you expect the area to be about equal to the sum of all these areas. Now, each of these little rectangles sweeps through sort of a thin box, a little uh, french fry looking thing. And it is a square box. And we know with confidence that the volume of this thin box will be the product of the height and the width and uh, the depth. So we know that volume is h delta x delta y. And if you add up all the various contributions of those thin boxes, then you should get an approximation for the volume. The h is constant everywhere. We can just pull that out. And of course, what's left is the sum of all the areas before. So looks like the volume should really be about equal to h times a. Um, now, what's going on here is this, this looks an awful lot like a Riemann sum. Um, and in fact, it is. It's a Riemann sum using two variables. And what we're getting here is a hint of, variable, of multivariable calculus. And we don't need multivariable calculus for this, but we're looking at this argument just enough to convince ourselves of the fundamental fact that whenever you build a cylinder out of an object, when you sweep that object through height h, you're going to get a volume equal to the base area times height. So let's take that principle going forward. We're going to need that principle. This is a clever little formula for finding volumes of what we might call slabs or abstract cylinders. So let's turn to this critical question. What's the volume of a potato? 
Of course, practically speaking, if you're in a kitchen, you probably want to submerge it in water and see how much water gets displaced. Uh, that'd probably be the most accurate way to do it, but let's uh, use a highfalutin technical way. Let's suppose you have some sort of potato CAT scan device and you can cut through and measure the cross-sectional area of the potato in any old direction you want. I'm sure you have one in your kitchen. So we're gonna take a uh, axis here. We're gonna measure the potato from one end of the potato to the other. So let's say these are marked A and B on this axis. And let's let sigma denote the cross-sectional area function. How does this work? So you pick an X, you slice perpendicular to this axis, and that area you get, we'll call that sigma of X. So that'll be the cross-sectional area function. Now, keeping the potato in the background, let's take a look at what this graph might look like. It could look something like this. You start at one end and the cross-sectional area is zero, it gets thicker in the middle, and then obviously the uh, cross-sectional area tapers, tapers off again as you approach the other endpoint. So this could be a, a graph of a typical potato. So here's, here's this cross-sectional area. And now the question is, how can we use sigma to find the volume of the potato? What are we going to do with this, this cross-sectional area function to find the volume of the potato? So the first step is we're going to divide the interval from A to B into equal subintervals. Let's say I have, they have common width delta x. And then we're going to choose sample points in each subinterval, and we're going to use our scanner to find the cross-sectional area at each of those points. Now, I think you know where this is going. This looks an awful lot like a Riemann sum. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take these cross-sectional areas, and we're going to imagine slabs based on these cross-sectional areas. And each of those slabs has width delta x. And because we know how to find the volume of a slab, we'll take the cross-sectional areas multiply them by delta x in each case. There are your six volumes of these slabs of potato. And we're going to add those all up and maybe convert it into sigma notation. And there is an approximation to the volume. And of course, we could increase the number of divisions and repeat to get better approximations. So here's the diagram you obtain, you get when you use, say, 23 divisions. And you could obviously chop this up into finer and finer bits. The, the interval a to b into finer and finer bits. But what we're really looking for is the limiting value of this process, which gives us an integral by definition. And so we wind up integrating the cross-sectional area from a to b. And that's the answer to our question. To find the volume, we integrate the cross-sectional area sigma from one end of the potato to the other. And, and that's how we're going to use the cross-sectional area to find the volume. Now, it's really important to sort of take a moment and think about these pictures and these formulas. It is true that the combined volume of these slabs pictured here is equal to that sum in the upper right-hand corner. That's true. However, don't be confused about what you're seeing in this picture. That diagram is not a picture of that Riemann sum. If you want a picture of that Riemann sum, you need to actually look at the function sigma. Look at the graph of the function sigma. There is your picture of the Riemann sum in the right hand, upper right-hand corner. All right. Now, we'll notice that the diagram is, there's your diagram of the Riemann sum. And what you're really getting at is the area under this curve yields a volume. Now, that's a very strange statement. How, are, how is an area a volume? Well, it just so happens that the area under this curve is a volume. And one way you can check, you're measuring x, say, say we're measuring x with centimeters. And the cross-sectional area then would be measured in square centimeters. So when you go to measure area, what units would be using in this diagram? In well, one direction, it's centimeters. In the other direction, it's centimeters squared. That gives you centimeters cubed. That's a unit of volume. So it sort of makes sense in this picture that the area under this picture is giving you volume of another picture that's not on the screen right now. This will happen a lot when you set up integrals to um, find you know, total mass, total charge, volume. You'll be finding things um, that don't seem to be related to an area, but an integral is an area under some curve. And it, you know, is worth sort of keeping that in mind and being able to think through exactly what end is up. So let's generalize this a bit. How do you use cross-sectional area to calculate volume generally? So the steps, sort of if we abstract out the steps, the first step is to find a direction so that perpendicular cross-sections are quote-unquote nice. And that 
is a fuzzy definition that depends on your problem. Basically, nice means something you can handle and that's going to work for you. In this case, let's say we pick this axis because it looks like cross sections are going to be squares. Now, let's give this axis a name. We'll call it U. Um, in practice, it could be X, Y, Z, some other variable name. You should not get attached to a variable name. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about the name itself. So we'll call this axis U. The cross sections look like squares in this case. And so generally, we need to determine the cross-sectional area function. This will be a matter of geometry or maybe uh, algebra if the formula is given to you. You have to work with it a little bit. There will be some way in the problem to figure out what this cross-sectional area is. Often, this is the heart of the problem. Just figuring out the cross-sectional area function is the hardest part. And if you're going to assemble these cross sections, you've, you've then has, you have to integrate with respect to u. That's sort of like summing those up. And that'll give you the volume. And if you do that, you're going to need to figure out the limits of integration. So you need to, you need to figure out the smallest u and the largest u um, at the extremities of your shape. And you put all that data together, and your volume is going to be this integral right here. So let's look at an example. Let's find the volume of a sphere of radius r. So um, the nice thing about this is it doesn't matter which direction you pick because all your cross sections are going to look the same. You're going to get disks. So let's use the x-axis, and we will cut perpendicular to the x-axis to get disks. We want to find the area of this disk as a function of x. Seems likely that we'll want to know something about the radius because if we can find the radius we can certainly find the area of a circle so let's find the radius as a function of x and what uh, we'll do is we'll remember here's the big r is the radius of our sphere and little r is the radius of our cross-sectional disk and if we've chosen an x then this segment will have length x and that's a right triangle so we've got a nice relationship between all three of these quantities which we need to solve for little r so here is little r as a function of x, where we are along the x-axis. Now the cross-sectional area function in this case is just going to be pi times the radius squared. And let's be shrewd about this. We need the radius squared as a function of x, so we can actually take directly from that equation to substitute. And that is our cross-sectional area function. And uh, if you want to make sure this makes sense, when x equals 0, you're going to get pi big R squared, which is an equatorial slice right through the middle. And when x is either capital R or little r, at the, or a negative r, beg your pardon, at the extremities, you should get 0 for your cross-sectional area, and that all makes sense. So there's your cross-section, and you assemble them along the x-axis, and we're going to integrate from negative big R to big R. And that integral then in abstraction looks like this but in this example looks like this that's just a polynomial big r is a constant find the antiderivative plug in the endpoints crank it out and simplify and there's your formula for the volume of a cube now there's actually a little too much work going on here so let's go back to the top and notice something important this function is an even function and we're integrating on an interval from negative big R to R. So there's no need to integrate all that way. What we could do is double the integral from 0 to R. And that actually makes a difference here, because then at one end you have 0 to plug in, and it's very hard to screw that up. So uh, cuts down on your work, uh, makes it more likely that you get the right answer. But there you go. There's your formula for the volume of a sphere of radius R. And it matches what we know. That's how you integrate cross-sectional area to find the volume of a sphere.